Hi, my name is Raquel Draws, and this is my presentation on the Bible proving the four laws of thermodynamics 100%. This presentation is for all, whether you're a student studying science at the high school level or pursuing a PhD at university, or working as an engineer, or you're just plain curious on how the Bible relates to science, this is for you. It is my hope that this presentation truly opens your heart to the truth and that you truly get blessed. There are four laws of thermodynamics. The first law is the conservation of energy. It says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. The second law deals with the increase of entropy. Total entropy of an isolated system always increases over time. The third law says that the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero Kelvin is zero. And the fourth law, which was renamed as zeroth law, deals with the body's internal equilibrium. This law was discovered after the first and second law, but has more significance, hence called the zeroth law. It says that if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with a third body, then they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Law number one, conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Specifically, it says total energy of an isolated system is constant. Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but cannot be created or destroyed. So to better understand this, let's break it up to three parts. Energy, constant, and boundaries. Energy. So what does secular science say? And what does the Bible say? Well, in secular science, energy is defined only as a what. In the Bible, it's actually defined with the five W's. In secular science, energy is heat or thermal, work and potential energy, velocity or kinetic energy, light. And in the Bible, energy is who, what, where, why, and when. Doesn't true in-depth investigation use the five W's? Remember when we were kids, we were always encouraged to ask with the five W's? Energy is the who, when, why, where. Does the Bible really say that? How? Well, simple things are usually brilliant, so let's start with the simple expression of energy. Regardless of who you are, scientists or not, you know a dead body has no energy. A live body has energy. What does a live body have? It has life. So, if you replace the word energy with life, interchangeably, you can see what the Bible says about it and get further insights into it. Think about it. If there's life in a body, it has temperature, movement, ability to work, and even light, as in the example of fireflies. So if you interchangeably use the word life with energy, it makes more sense. And remember how your mother used to say you have so much potential? So references in the Bible, who and what is energy, or who is what is life? Jesus is the life. In the New Testament, the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Where, why, and when? Life is in Jesus and came from Jesus to give light to everyone, and he already existed even in the beginning. In the book of John, in the New Testament, chapter 1, 1 to 5, in the beginning the Word, who is Jesus, already existed. He was with God, and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. He created everything there is. Nothing exists that he didn't make. Life itself was in him and this life gives light to everyone. The light shines through the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So where, 
Where's life or where was energy? It's in Jesus. Why? It's because he wanted to give light to everyone. And when? It was in the beginning. He already existed. So, constant. Remember how it says energy is constant? And that if you use the word life with energy, Jesus is the life, so Jesus is the energy. Jesus is constant. It actually says in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That spells it out pretty much. Constant. Boundaries. Created nor destroyed. So when it says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, think of the word create and destroy as boundary points. To create is to begin, and to destroy is to end. So think of it this way. If the beginning point is the same as the end point, there really is no beginning and no end. It's a continuous circular loop, meaning eternal. Jesus is eternal. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Boundaries. Another thing about boundaries is that they are defined by God. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in the Old Testament, chapter 3, verse 14, And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose in this is that people should fear Him. That is why you can't add to the energy that He has put into the system, nor take it away, because He defines it. So God is everywhere. He is eternal. He is the beginning and the end. He is infinite. And He is the ultimate energy. And from Him, He took a small piece of Him and transformed it into our universe. From within Him, He created the universe, which consists of the earth and us human beings and animals. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, death entered our universe. And that isolated us from God. We no longer became eternal. We became physical. And time existed from that point on. So here's a summary. Number one, God is energy and is the ultimate source of energy. He is energy both inside and outside of the isolated system. The isolated system is our world, universe. You put energy into the universe and you cannot add or take away from this total energy. God is the ultimate energy, and you cannot create God nor destroy God. He is eternal. God has already existed even before the beginning, and is always constant. Fourth, Jesus is God. In the beginning, He already existed. Jesus was with God, and He was God. Jesus is connected to God the Father, and is eternal and constant. That summarizes Law number one, conservation of energy from the biblical point of view. Moving on to law number two, increasing entropy. The total entropy of an isolated system always increases over time. To be specific, it says that the total entropy of an isolated system always increases over time or remain constant in ideal cases where the system is in a steady state are undergoing a reversible process. The increase in entropy accounts for the irreversibility of natural processes and the asymmetry between future and past. Basically, the second law deals with the direction of natural processes, or what is famously known by secular scientists, the law of decay. So remember that diagram here where we live in this isolated system? This system is decaying because of sin or entropy. Entropy. So what does secular science say and what does the Bible say? In secular science, entropy is chaos disorder or measure of molecular disorder, inefficiency, unusable energy, the Bible says entropy is more accurately described as sin, curse, decay, death, 
disorder. The natural process is, if you look at life, the good tends to go towards evil, stable to chaos, young to old. A house or a bedroom doesn't get clean on its own. It has a tendency to become dirty if you don't put the effort into cleaning it. So it basically says we live in a fallen world. Entropy is sin. Fallen world. So how did sin come to exist? In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and care for it. But the Lord God gave him this warning, You may freely eat any fruit in the garden except fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. That is how sin came to exist. What is the result and the power of sin? Well, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 56, For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. So the power of sin is death. And furthermore, in the book of Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Entropy is sin. Entropy is always increasing over time. So is sin increasing over time? Let's look at the Bible reference. In the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, it says, You should also know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving, unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and have no interest in what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. You must stay away from people like that. So, is sin really increasing over time? What does the news say? Here are some secular scientific references. This is an article dated 14 September 2009, where it says that the spoiled generation, parents who failed to exert authority breeding youngsters with no respect for anyone. The generation these days are mostly disobedient to parents. Another article dated 15th of June 2006, it says, Why are the youth of today so rude? Didn't it say in the Bible that in the last days, people will be disobedient to their parents? Another secular scientific reference, marriage and divorce rates in the world. This diagram shows 144 years of marriage and divorce rate in the United States. See how the marriage rate is going down and the divorce rate is going up? Marriage is not held sacred anymore. The same for the statistics in England and Wales. This is from 1930 to 2010. Again, marriage is not held sacred anymore. So, entropy is always increasing over time. And the result of sin is death. Even our universe is actually dying, and scientists say this too. So here are some scientific theories on how our universe will end. The Big Freeze, also known as the Heat Death. The Big Crunch. The Big Change. And the Big Rip. These theories are believed to occur when entropy has reached its maximum. The entropy of the universe is going from stable to unstable and it is increasing and this entropy is irreversible. The universe dies at maximum entropy. So here are some biblical references. In the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, and God has also commanded that the heavens and the earth will be consumed by fire on the day of judgment when ungodly people will perish. It further says in 
verse 10 to 13, But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and everything in them will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be exposed to judgment. Since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy godly lives you should be living. You should look forward to that day and hurry it along, the day when God will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth he has promised, a world where everyone is right with God. So let's take a look at the secular scientific theories on how our universe will end. The Big Freeze, also known as Heat Death. It is based on assumptions that the universe is expanding by observing the stars decaying. With time, the stars are burning less and less. And they believe that when the universe has expanded to its maximum, everything will be at one temperature. And at one temperature, there will be no heat difference anymore, and hence, heat death. Heat difference is required for work, and hence, no life is sustained anymore. This is actually based on a pagan myth. But when you really think about it, especially on the third law, it says that the entropy at zero Kelvin temperature is zero. So it sounds like it contradicts the third law at 0K temperature, zero entropy, not maximum. The Big Crunch it is based on the assumption that, again, the universe is expanding via observations of decaying stars. And they believe that when the universe has expanded, the opposing force will try to contract it back, just like stretching an elastic band. As the universe contracts, matter becomes more dense and generates heat and explodes in flames. But how can opposing energy, which tries to bring it back to stability, increase if entropy is irreversible? It will have been used up at max entropy. Just think about it. Entropy of the universe is increasing. It's leading towards instability. It cannot be reversed. The third theory, the big change. This is based on the assumption that there is a true and false vacuum out there. That the vacuum which we experience here on Earth may not be the true vacuum. The true vacuum could be in the universe at a lower energy state. The Higgs boson particle, or famously known as God particle, because of the destruction that it could lead to the universe, it is discovered at the physics lab at Switzerland. And this famous secular physicist Stephen Hawking said that if this God particle in the universe experiences a change in its energy field level, that instability could destroy the universe and he speculates that it could happen any time and we wouldn't see it coming. The Big Rip This is based on the assumptions that the universe is expanding via observation of decaying stars and that when the universe has expanded to maximum, it will burst like a balloon. So the universe dies at maximum entropy. What does the Bible say again? It says that the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and everything in them will disappear in fire. So it looks like all it takes is a slight change in instability. Think about it. Every planet and stars is held in place at the required exact distances. Any slight change can cause instability. For example, if the sun is any closer to the earth, it will consume the earth. So any slight instability can cause an explosion and fire. Moving on to law number three, zero entropy at zero temperature, Kelvin. It says that the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is exactly equal to zero. A perfect crystal means all molecules are perfectly identical and aligned throughout the substance. According to scientists, this does not exist. An absolute zero is the lowest temperature known to scientists in which there cannot be any temperature below this point. 
temperature to which all substances or gases can be cooled to and all molecular movement cease. Now, this example is used, such as the perfect crystal, for the sake of calculations. Well, what does the Bible say about this law, and what does real life show you? You stop sinning when you die. A dead body has no temperature, it's cold, and a dead body cannot sin. So can our universe really have zero sin or zero entropy? No, because... Even though people die and animals die, there are always new people, new animals being born. So the only way that this can actually happen is if everything is wiped out. All life form is removed, is gone. And that brings us back again to law number two, the law of decay. Specifically how the universe will end, the death of our universe. So that sums it up for this law. It's short and simple. Law number four, zeroth law, bodies in thermal equilibrium. It says if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with a third body, then they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. Thermal equilibrium means that the objects have the same temperature, that is the common property that they have together. So if object A has the same temperature as object B, and if object B has the same temperature as object C, then object A and object C have the same temperature. Body B is like a thermometer. The zeroth law therefore enables us to use thermometers to compare the temperatures of any objects we like. You need object B, the thermometer, in order to know if object A and C are at the same temperature. A third body is required. So a third body is required. Well, what does secular science say? A third body, or the third body, introduced the unit measure of temperature, and thus the thermometer. Only a body that has been in contact with the first body, the reference body, can determine how other bodies measure up to the reference body. This introduction of the temperature unit set the framework for the first and second law that it is deemed more significant and thus renamed zeroth law. From a biblical point of view, why do you need the third body? There's God, the Father, who is eternal, and there's you, non-eternal, because of sin. There's Jesus, who is the third body. He is also eternal and came from God. He is the only one in holy equilibrium with the Father and came from the Father. Jesus also became human and abided with us. Thus, Jesus is the holy meter, like the thermometer, and abiding in Jesus makes us eternal with God. The third body, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one who can show you how you measure up to God. You cannot measure yourself against God since you have never been in contact with God. There is no such thing as moral relativity. You cannot be in contact with God because of your sin. Non-eternal and eternal cannot coexist forever and become one. Eternal is holy, it's sinless, and non-eternal, physical, has sin. Sin cannot exist in the presence of holiness. In the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and people. He is the man, Christ Jesus. Holy versus sin. What is the big deal? Well, in the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 46, verse 20, it goes, He explained, this is where the priests will cook the meat from the guilt offerings and sin offerings and bake the flour from the grain offerings into bread. They will do it here to avoid carrying the sacrifices through the outer courtyard and harming the people by transmitting holiness to them. So you see, if holiness is transmitted to people, it can actually harm you, more specifically kill you. So you, being a sinner cannot be in contact with God the Father who is holy and has no sin because 
as much as God loves you, His holiness will unintentionally kill you. Holiness destroys sin, but Jesus paid for our sins at the cross so we can live after this life and everything in this world is over. Sin cannot coexist with holiness and that is why our universe is decaying and needs to end. God will destroy the heavens and the earth. The heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and everything in them will disappear in fire. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth, he has promised. A world where everyone is right with God. How are you made right with God? For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and people. He is the man, Christ Jesus. So remember this picture where God is everywhere and He is eternal and we live in this isolated system where sin exists? Well, God will destroy the heavens and the earth. And the reason for that is because holiness cannot coexist with sin forever. There is a time limit. But the good news is, He will create a new heaven and new earth, where we will no longer be isolated from God anymore. But this can only happen if you've accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, which He paid on the cross by dying for your sins, because only then you will be sinless. So the ultimate law of thermodynamics actually points to Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Believe it or not, like it or not, want it or not, you need Jesus. God bless you.